Can we as humans predict the future? All the people we just talked about were very intelligent people. But it takes more than intelligence to predict the future. We humans do not know what will happen in the next few minutes, much less further into the future. But there is someone who does know the future. God knows everything that has happened and will happen in the future. And best of all, in the Bible, God has shared that really important things that are going to happen to his chosen people on earth will happen before he returns. Many astrologers and those with crystal balls claim to know the future, but only God can predict the future thousands of years in advance. If we want to know how the world ends and all the facts surrounding the end, all we have to do is open our Bible and study. The Word of God reveals to us the future down through the ages until the coming of Jesus. And he tells us the events that will occur after he comes during the millennium or the thousand years after. So we get all that information from the most truthful source, which is the Bible. God challenges false prophets, and we read about this in Isaiah 46, 9. He says, for I am God, and there is no other. I am God, and there is none like me, declaring the end from the beginning and from ancient times, things that are not yet done. God alone can declare the end from the beginning. The Bible alone outlines history in advance of it occurring. Let's go back now to the book of Daniel, to, ancient, to the ancient king's palace. It is King Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, who ruled the largest and richest nation in the world at that time. It was 500 years before Jesus was born. God gave this king a dream that outlines the nations that will rule the world from his kingdom to the state of the world just before Jesus returns. We will discover that using the symbol of a man of mud and metal, God provided his readers in the word of God exactly what was going to happen and when from that king's dream all the way to the end of the world. Who wouldn't want to know that? And it's in the Bible in multiple places. And we're talking about Daniel, the book of Daniel. In order to get to the palace, you would have had to enter the Ishtar, kind of pronounced Easter, gate. You can see it up on the screen. You would have walked on a glazed brick road. Archaeologists uncovered and reconstructed this gate, and it's in Berlin, Germany, in the museum, if you ever want to see it. This is a photo of the reconstructed gate. There are numerous kilns throughout the land, and these bricks were glazed blue, and the lions were put on there in gold. Ancient Babylon had fine china and dishes and the most beautiful architectural constructions. We often think, when we think back in history, of bare bones. We think they weren't near as intelligent as we are today, nor did they have the technology. We can't imagine the things that were in Babylon, the most beautiful city in the world at that time. Um, Nebuchadnezzar was the greatest and most powerful ruler who lived on the earth. He was a heathen king who destroyed Jerusalem. We remember that early in the story. He destroyed Jerusalem about eight to ten years prior, in, prior to his dream, and he brought captivity, the Hebrews, back to Babylon. Most of them were slaves. King Nebuchadnezzar had gone to sleep one night and had this very strange, powerful dream, and it really disturbed him. The next morning, he couldn't remember it, but he knew it had to be significant. So he decided to get help. Well, let's read the story of Daniel 2, verses 1 through 3. 
In the second year of his reign, Nebuchadnezzar had dreams. His mind was troubled, and he could not sleep. So the king summoned the magicians, enchanters, sorcerers, and astrologers to tell him what he had dreamed. When they came in and stood before the king, he said to them, I've had a dream that troubles me, and I want to know what it means. Now in those days, the magicians would cut the liver of a calf in half and look for designs, or they'd drop oil in water and look for a pattern and then make up something to tell the king. The sorcerer, sorcerers would pretend to communicate with the dead and then give a vague answer to the king. The astrologers would study the position of the stars and then they would make up an answer. They probably had done this many times before, which is why the king sent for them on this night. Nebuchadnezzar was obviously furious. He demanded that they tell him his dream right then, but they could not. You see, the difference was before he would tell them the dream and they would just interpret it so they pretty much could say whatever they wanted. But this time he's saying, tell me what I dreamed. Ooh, that's a little bit more powerful. And they could not do it. So he gave an order to execute all the wise men of Babylon. Every category of wise men, that would be astrologers, wise men, Chaldeans, magicians. That meant their wives, their children, and their families would also be executed. So the order went out for the execution. Among the wise men of Babylon was a young Hebrew in his late teens, and his name was Daniel. He was a Hebrew captive brought from Jerusalem when Nebuchadnezzar had captured Jerusalem several years earlier. Daniel, although a slave in the king's household, was true to his God. He asked the overseer, Arioch, if he could have time to ask his God for an answer to the king's dream. Daniel, along with several hundred men who were counselors to the king, faced certain death if Daniel could not explain that dream. But Daniel knew just what to do. He knew he could go to God in prayer, and God would hear his, his prayer and answer. He got his three buddies that were with him, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, to join him in prayer to ask God to give to him the answer to the king's dream. Prayer makes a difference in our lives, too. God loves us just as much as he did Daniel, and he'll hear our prayers just as quickly as Daniel's prayer went up. If we're facing any problems in our life, we have to take the problem to God in prayer. Once we've given it to God, be at peace because God is in charge of the problem now and you no longer have to worry. You have to learn to let it go and give it to God. We should teach our children to pray. This little cutie is my granddaughter, Madeline. I can't resist. All of us grandmothers know any chance we get to show our little grandchildren we do. But this is little Madeline praying. She learned at an early age to pray. And we have to teach our children and our grandchildren how important prayer is. Daniel's parents taught him about God and prayer at an early age. When he was taken a slave, he would have been an early teenager. But through all that happened to his people during that time, Daniel remained faithful to God. After prayer, asking God to show him the answer to the king's dream, Daniel went to bed and went to sleep. Now I wonder how many of us could go to sleep if we knew the next day we were going to be killed if we did not come up with this dream. That, that's amazing, the amount of peace that God gives him when he truly turns something over to God and trusts that God will answer that prayer. That's the kind of faith that we hope that we all have here on this earth, and we'll need it in the future. 
That night, God revealed the dream to Daniel while he slept. And when he arose the next morning, he requested to be taken before King Nebuchadnezzar. Notice what Daniel said. Notice that he did not take any credit for himself. He said, there is a God in heaven who reveals secrets and has made known what will be in the latter days. The latter days meaning just before Jesus returns. Daniel affirmed that his God gives guidance and wisdom and direction to those who will listen. Then Daniel began reminding the king of what he had seen in his dream. He said, you saw a great image carved without hands. It looked like a man made of metal. Each part of the man represented a different nation that would rule the world right down to the breakup of the last kingdom signified in the dream by the feet of clay and iron. That clay and iron would not stick together, and it would be that way until Jesus returns. The metal man was made out of gold, silver, brass, and iron with feet of clay and iron, and then a great stone would come out of the sky and demolish it all and fill the entire earth. Then Daniel explained to King Nebuchadnezzar what it all meant. Nebuchadnezzar must have been thrilled when Daniel told him that he was the head of gold, that the golden head represented Babylon that ruled the world at that time. And then through Daniel, God outlined the nations that would dominate the world until the end of time. God said would, there would only be four nations that would rule the world and the fourth nation would break up into smaller kingdoms that would not cleave together. Furthermore, the remnant of the last nation would morph into a religious power. In Daniel's day, the whole world bowed at the feet of Babylon. It was the greatest city and the richest nation in the world. Archaeologists discovered a clay tablet that was a letter from Nebuchadnezzar that describes the wealth and the splendor of Babylon. King Nebuchadnezzar wrote that the whole earth bowed prostrate at her feet. He was not a humble man. Babylon was more than 60 miles around with walls that are 90 feet tall, and the walls were wide enough to drive three chariots side by side around the city wall. The river Euphrates flowed right through the center of Babylon, providing constant water. And there was a 20-year food supply inside the walls should any nation try to attack them. So he felt like he was heavily fortified, completely prepared and nothing could take his nation down. He wrote in another inscription that you see on the screen, the excellence of this kingdom, may it last forever. Nobody on earth thought it was possible for anything to ever happen to this rich, marvelous society. The ruins of Babylon are just 60 miles from modern Baghdad and Iraq. Saddam Hussein, planned to rebuild Babylon and be its king. But we know how that turned out for him. Had he read the Bible, he could have saved himself a lot of trouble, time, and money, and perhaps his life. Isaiah said, and Babylon will never be inhabited, nor will it be settled from generation to generation, nor will the Arabian pitch their tents there, nor will the shepherds make their sheepfolds there. Again, that's in the Bible in Isaiah 13, 17 through 20. This prophecy came true, and Saddam Hussein is dead. Babylon ruled the world from 605 to 539 B.C. Daniel told Nebuchadnezzar 
that he had the head of gold, but that another nation represented by the chest of silver, we know as Medo-Persia, would conquer Babylon. But then Medo-Persia would then followed up, be conquered by Greece, represented by the thighs of brass, and the iron legs of the image represented the mighty Roman Empire that would then conquer Greece. The Roman Empire then would become divided and morph into something very different from the conquering nation. The feet of this image was made of mud and metal, basically clay and iron. And we know that clay and iron do not mix together. God said these nations would never cleave together. It must have been difficult to look King Nebuchadnezzar in the eye and tell him his kingdom was going to end. But Daniel was telling him what God revealed to him. He said, but after you shall arise another kingdom inferior to yours, just as silver is inferior to gold. The kingdom that conquered Babylon would be the Medo-Persia Empire. Represented by the chest of silver, the Medo-Persian Empire conquered Babylon in 539 B.C., and that lasted until 331 B.C. It's interesting how the Medes and Persians took over Babylon. Now remember, they were the ruling kingdom of the world. So how was an inferior kingdom going to come in and take over? Nebuchadnezzar, we know at the time, was dead. Daniel, his, Daniel was an old man, and Babylon was now ruled by Nebuchadnezzar's grandson, Belshazzar. One night, Belshazzar had a drunken feast with 1,000 of his government officials and their ladies. He had heard all the stories about his grandfather, Nebuchadnezzar, and how the God of the universe became known to him. He knew the captured treasures from their temple were stored in Babylon. He thought it would be fun to call on the holy treasures that Babylon had taken from the sanctuary in Jerusalem when they captured it. He thought it would be so much fun to use these golden cups. So he called for the golden cups to be brought. And when they were handed to Belshazzar, he toasted his gods, mocking the God of heaven. He obviously did not believe the stories about how the God of the universe had dealt with Nebuchadnezzar, his grandfather. While he was toasting his gods, a hand appeared with fingers of fire and wrote high on the wall of the banquet hall. The fiery fingers wrote, Mini Teco Perez. It was a language that nobody at the party knew. At the urging of the queen, Daniel was called to translate. Daniel would have probably been a very old man by then, and he was probably in bed. Uh, I would guess he was probably in his 80s, and he must have gotten out of bed to come to the party just to be able to translate this. Daniel told Belshazzar and the crowd that Mini, which meant God hath numbered thy kingdom and finished it. Tekel means thou art weighed in the balances and found wanting. And Perez meant thy kingdom is divided and given to the Medes and Persians. Approximately 150 years before this happened, the Bible had predicted it. In fact, 150 years before General Cyrus's birth, it had been predicted that he would capture Babylon and exactly how he would do it. Isaiah 45, 1 says, Thus says the Lord to his anointed, to Cyrus, whose right hand I have held, to subdue nations before him and loose the armor of the kings, to open before him the double doors so that the gates will not be shut. And history tells us how accurate prophecy is. 
Cyrus dammed up the Euphrates River that ran through the center of Babylon. The Babylonian guards had left the gates to the first wall that closed down into the riverbed. They had left them open, as well as the gate to the second wall under the city and had left those unlocked. Cyrus's army marched on the dry riverbed under the gates to the second wall and into the city and came up behind Belshazzar's throne room. Cyrus killed Belshazzar and the entire drunken government with no resistance. This is the Cyrus Cylinder located in the British Museum in London that describes his attack and overthrow of Babylon. It's nine inches long and four inches around. So on the screen it looks very large, but it is not very large. It's a small cylinder, and with the inscriptions, you get the description of how this occurred. The Medo-Persian Empire ruled from 539 to 331 BC, but the prophecy of the strange man of mud and metal was only half over. There was another two kingdoms to come. The next kingdom was represented as the thighs of brass. Daniel 2.39 says, then another, a third kingdom of bronze which shall rule over all the earth would arise. What nation overthrew the Medes and Persians? Well, we know it as the Greek Empire, under the leadership of Alexander the Great. At 33 years old, Alexander arose as the greatest general in the world at that time. By the age of 33, Alexander had conquered the entire then known world. One historian wrote, I am persuaded that there was no nation, city, nor people where his name did not reach. There seems to me to have been some divine hand presiding both over his birth and actions. Even secular historians recognize the destiny of nations and that a divine hand has been guiding them. And we need to understand that a divine hand is guiding the nations. God puts them up and takes them down according to his divine plan. When we come, when we get very upset about the politics in our world, stop and think. Nobody rules except God's will. Even when we don't understand it, God is in charge of the world. Well in advance of this happening, those kingdoms were put up and taken down right on schedule. Well in advance of them happening. So you don't think he knows our future and what's going to happen with our government and who's going to lead our nation? He knows all of it, so we don't need to fret over it. We don't need to be like the people in the rest of the world that get all upset and aggravated and irritated and frustrated. We shouldn't. We should say, God, you're in control, and we're grateful that you are, because not one of us would be any smarter than what God could do for the future of our planet. But... Would Greece rule supreme forever? No. They ruled from 331 B.C. to 168 B.C. Then the Iron Monarchy of Rome, described by Daniel as the fourth kingdom, actually conquered Greece. The Bible says in Daniel 2.40, Finally, there will be a fourth kingdom, strong as iron. For iron breaks and smashes everything. Indeed, the Roman Empire extended throughout the then known world. It was a cruel empire, breaking everything and everybody in its path. It was the ruling power when Jesus was born. Historians recognize Rome in the following sequence. Rome ruled the world from, 168, from 168 years before Christ to the mid-4th century after Christ's death. That would have been around sometime in the 300s in our world history. 
Arthur Gibbons in the decline and fall of the Roman Empire wrote, the images of gold, of silver, or brass that might serve to represent the nations and their kings were successively broken by the iron monarchy of Rome. Would there be a fifth nation that would arise and rule the world? No. That's what prophecy tells us. Prophecy said that the iron rule of Rome would be displaced by the feet of iron and clay, meaning the Roman Empire would be divided up. And this was predicted 600 years before this happened. Daniel 2.41 states, Where, Whereas you saw the feet and toes, partly of potter's clay and partly of iron, the kingdom shall be divided. Ten barbarian tribes of Eastern and Western Europe overthrew Rome and occupied its territory. We recognize these tribes by their modern names today. Back then, they were called the Alemanni, which is Germany, Burgundy, which is the Swiss, the Franks, which are the French, Lombards, which are the Italians, Saxons, which are the English, Suevi, which are the Portuguese, Visigoths, which are the Spanish. Prophecy says that three tribes would fall to Rome and become extinct, and they were. They were the Heruli, the Vandals, and the Ostrogoths, exactly as the Bible had predicted. God, through Daniel, said that Babylon would fall to the Medan Persian Empire. They would be conquered by the Greeks, and the Greeks would fall to the Romans. However, the Roman Empire would be divided, and division is now known as Europe. And you can see it on the screen with the tribal names on the map. So what was the Roman Empire is divided into the, the places we know today in Europe. The Bible predicted that they would try to unite by mixing their seed. They say that in Daniel 2.43, he says, as you saw iron mixed with ceramic clay, they will mingle with seed of men. This means that the intermarriage between royal houses was predicted by God. Napoleon married Louise of Austria that united him with the Habsburg line. Basically, they were trying to marry and unite with each other so they could form a larger kingdom and take over. You see, they are, they've always been fighting to take over and be the kingdom that ruled next. And they thought by marrying kings and queens, putting their children together, and having them unite, it would bring the kingdoms together. If you go to Denmark and visit the Frederiksberg Castle, its royal chamber, you will see a drawing of the royal family tree, united intermarriage through King Frederick and Queen Diana. Daniel 2.42 says, but they will not adhere to one another. Just as iron does not mix with clay, the divisions of Europe and its tempestuous history is an eloquent testimony to the accuracy of God's prophecy. God said they will not adhere to one another, just as iron does not mix with clay. God was right. Would-be rulers Louis XIV, Charles V, all attempted to unite Europe, and they both failed. Kings and politicians have tried to unite Europe, but they have all failed. Evidently, Napoleon knew Bible prophecy. After his defeat in 1815, at the Battle of Waterloo, he reportedly said, God Almighty is too much for me. You see, we can't go against God's prophetic word. If God says it's going to be this way, that will be the outcome. It is not our choice to decide that we will find a better way or another way because it will not succeed. God's plan is always perfect. 
Hitler rose to power, we know, in the 1930s and 40s with the intention of ruling Europe and then the world. But God said there would be no power that would rise and rule the nations we know as Europe today because they will not cleave to one another. Even as they try to unite Europe by doing away with borders and visas, making it very easy for you to enter one country and leave through another, and even as they attempt to unite Europe by the monetary exchange, the euro, it has not worked. There are multiple books outlining China's strategy to take over the world as the foremost global superpower. The 100-year marathon outlines how they're going to do it. So far, they've been very successful. The Dragon's Silver Tongue is another book telling us how China will rule the world. But after reading these books, you realize, and Ellie said she would like to send Daniel chapter 2 to the Chinese government because will China rule the world? Not a chance. God has told us what will happen. Everything predicted and prophesied in the past has come true. Everything, 100% all the time. So if he says they will not cleave to one another, I don't think we're going to see that in, in happening in this world. God says, no, they will not be the superpower to rule the world. So hopefully that brings relief to some of you. I know if you watch news and you see what's going on, and we're all kind of skeptics now because of the way that our world is, you would start to think, what is going on? I've, even in conversations the other night at Bible study, we had this conversation about what is going on with all these secret things happening, these Chinese balloons floating overhead. What is going on? There's something going on in our world that somebody is trying to do something to take over, perhaps the United States or whatever, but prophecy says no. The Bible assures us that this world's nations, all the nations in the world, are in God's hands. History is not a kaleidoscope of random nations that rise and rule because they choose to do it. God is in total control. History confirms what the Bible said 2,500 years in advance, just as Daniel had revealed to King Nebuchadnezzar. God told Nebuchadnezzar, through his prophet Daniel, that the dream is certain and the interpretation thereof sure. God tells us what happens next, and since everything prophesied has come true, we can expect the last of the prophecy will also come true. I think about the fact that if God has told us what will happen up into the moment that Jesus returns to bring us to our heavenly home, we should want to know, not because we're going to change it, but because we're going to want to be prepared for it. It helps to strengthen our own resolve when we see testimony after testimony after testimony of everything coming to play right before our eyes. People are surprised at the number of hurricanes and tornadoes and uh, all kinds of things going on in our world. People are saying, what is going on? This world just seems to be falling apart. It was all prophesied in advance. We, we know this. If you read Bible prophecy, open your Bibles to Daniel and to Revelation. We have numerous Bible studies on both, both books in great detail that can show you exactly what God has told us will happen and is happening and will be happening in the future. And we can be prepared, again, not to stop it, not to fret over it. God does not want us worrying about tomorrow. 
He wants us to be focused on doing his will today. If you're always preparing for the next day and the next day and the next day, you're not living in the day that God gave you. He gave you these 24 hours of this day to be in this moment and doing his work. And fortunately for us today, it's praising and worshiping God on our Sabbath. So don't be letting your mind wander and worry about tomorrow because God is in full control of tomorrow. The last of Daniel 2.44, prophecy of the strange man of mud and metal says, And in the days of these kings shall the God of heaven set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed. A large rock came from the sky and smote the image on its feet, and the image dissolved into dust, and the rock filled the entire earth. And the kingdom represented by the rock was the kingdom of God. Daniel 2.44 says, And the kingdom shall not be left to other people, but it should break into pieces and consume all these kingdoms, and it shall stand forever. Amen? Are you excited about being part of that kingdom? That will be the one that lasts forever and ever. That's the one we want to be part of. That's when Jesus returns to take us to our eternal home. But you have to know God. You have to study his word. You have to understand his moral commandments and follow those. Because God put those there to help us be guided so that we could return to our heavenly home. And we're looking forward to that day. When we study Daniel 2, we understand that God is in charge of this world and all its rulers and all its people. It confirms our faith in him that he could predict the future so accurately, centuries before it happened. We can trust ourselves to him. God, help us to submit our lives to you every single day. We want to be part of the joyous end of this prophecy by being in heaven with God. We all are here for a purpose. And we are all here today because it was ordained by God that we would be here today listening and learning, worshiping and praising God here today. So we need to be secure in knowing that we will join each other in our heavenly home as long as we continue to put God first in our lives. And I'm grateful for each and every one of you investing time in your life to be here today to study God's word. It is the best thing that we can do on the Sabbath is to read his word, learn more about him, and grow our relationship with him.